Get ready to celebrate God's call to go. Here's your weekly dose of heartwarming encouragement for the missionary in all of us. Welcome to Missions Change My Life. Now here's your host, Pastor Kevin. Good morning. I'm Pastor Kevin, founder and executive director of Global Hope India, and your host for Missions Change My Life podcast. This is a poor kid from rural North Carolina that has now flown over a million miles to 27 different countries. I've taken nearly a thousand people on mission trips to India. We've collected millions for God's work among Indian nationals. I will be sharing compelling stories of radical transformation from ordinary people. Buckle up, you're gonna hear some amazing stories I'm going to take you right inside 20 plus years of real life mission trip devotional moments, and we will be sharing practical tools to empower and equip you. Go to globalhopeindia.org forward slash resources as God uses missions to change your life. Get ready, people. Josh is on the show today. Let me tell you why I am so excited to introduce you to Josh. He is the current president of the board of directors of Global Hope India. He and his wife, Katie, have three children and they live in Apex, North Carolina. Josh holds a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from North Carolina State University. He is employed at Tetvis as an engineering and capital projects manager. Josh and Katie attend Summit Church with Pastor J.D. Greer. Josh is involved there on the prayer team, First Impressions. He's a small group leader and is involved in many different ways. When you see Josh, be sure to ask him about competing in a moon pie eating contest. People, put your hands together and help me give a warm welcome to my friend Josh. Josh, welcome to Missions Change My Life. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Glad to be here. Uh, I know that it is that you're very reluctant to be on the show, but I'm very grateful that you are with us today because you have incredible passion uh, for missions and for the gospel, and uh, I can't wait for that to come out to all of our listeners today. How are you doing? Doing well. Doing well. We are recording this over the phone because of the shutdown occurring in the USA and around the world because of the COVID-19 pandemic. How's Mm -hmm. your family doing with that? Uh, They're doing well. You know, we're, we're getting along. We live out in the woods, so it's not too bad. Uh, From a isolation standpoint, we're not having to hide inside the house. The kids can still go explore the woods, but Mm -hmm. yeah, we're doing well. Like I say, the hardest part is engaging with people. Well, discipling. Yeah. So you and your family are known to be very relational, always an open kitchen and just people coming and going for Bible study and ministry all throughout the week. What's life like when that can't happen? It's, it's different. You know, I mean, we have to make a very intentional try at calling people and you, you realize how much you take for granted in seeing people physically each week Mm -hmm. uh, and how, and how much more work it seems to take, at least for me and my family uh, to call people and to catch up that way. We're not, we're not tons for text messaging. We're more for uh, engaging face to face. And so it's, it's different, but uh, we have a couple that lives with us in an apartment that we built to kind of foster a community. And so Mm -hmm. since they live with us, we at least do get to see some people. We're not completely trapped with just our family, but it's, it's tough. Well, our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone who is losing Mm -hmm. loved ones right now Mm -hmm. at scary rates and all of the medical team, uh, healthcare workers and first responders on the front line that are bearing the brunt of this. I mean, 99% of America really still has no idea to the stress Mm -hmm. level in epicenter, you know, like in New York city Mm -hmm. and other places. That's right. And even our hearts and prayers go out to our friends in India. It's getting, getting a lot worse there for millions of people who have lost their jobs and no national transportation. Now they're just literally stuck uh, without Mm -hmm. food and and water. Have a lot to pray about right now. Um, That's right. I'm blessed that you and I go way back and I've taken a thousand people over to India and the vast majority of those thousand know Josh. Um, You're very (laughs) much central in the radar of Global Hope India. And now you're even serving on the board as as the president of the board of directors. Uh, But let's get to know Josh. Uh, Just bring us up to speed. 
with you, your family, your, your story of faith, and then we'll dive into the trip over to India. Sure. Yeah. So um, I've been married to my wonderful, amazing wife, Katie, uh, for 12 years. We've been together about 18 or 19 years now. My, uh, I got three kids, soon to be eight, and then six and three. So it's a, it's a wild and engaging time at our house, especially during the quarantine. We've got kids with lots of energy and uh, an excitement to get out, mm-hmm. uh, but also to be shepherded. You know, that's what we're noticing uh, mostly with our eight and six year old is they have hearts that are receptive to real conversation now. And that's probably been the biggest change for us is mm-hmm. uh, having to be very cognizant and intentional with the short time that we have with them. I didn't expect that reality to hit so quickly. You know, you, you take that for granted as you're. Uh, flying through those very early years, and so that's been uh, that's been a big change. So tell us about your story of faith. Did you grow? Mm. Were you born and brought into the first pew of a church? Uh, yeah, the week you were born. Yeah, we uh, we sat fifth row back actually, okay. but um, yeah, I grew up as a as a classic story goes. Every time the church doors were open, we were there, and uh, I was very blessed to have a family that that loved the Lord and that uh, wanted to see His name made great in the relationships that we had. International missions wasn't really a thing for me growing up. Our church didn't do much with it uh, other than, you know, Lottie Moon and IMB uh, things, or we'd have a missionary come in to give us a talk, but there wasn't a lot there. My dad uh, led me to faith in a conversation one night that I remember oh, that's and being able to walk through that. And so having having that memory is really nice. But like everybody's faith journey uh, from, from death to life is what it was. And that uh, then began the long process of sanctification that Uh, seems to be taking longer now than it did as I was a young kid. And that's probably the most frustrating aspect of the Christian life for me right now um, is just how long sanctification is going. I don't feel like I'm any further along than I was when I was eight, Mm. you know, and I know that's not true because I have markers in my life that I can look back to uh, where God was awakening me to new truths about who he is, about the person and work of Jesus Christ, about the totality of his rule and reign in the world and in my life specifically, in what submission to that looks like. My wife and I, we've been together since we were 16. Seeing her change and transformation over the years and to see how we have complemented each other and helped each other and spurred one another on and growing has probably been the biggest catalyst for me. We graduated college. We got married, I guess, about a week after she graduated. And we moved here to Raleigh, where we were, uh, where I had gone to school. And uh, we joined the Summit Church. We uh, we had known about uh, uh, the church from high or from college, excuse me, and got plugged in there. And that's where we really started deepening at a much greater rate, if that makes sense. Uh, what it, to tease out the full implications of the gospel in our lives through college? She and I had served at some uh, some Christian sports camps, and so it was uh, it was encouraging that even over some of our summers we were able to grow and deepen our faith very intentionally while still pouring into others. But yeah, God really used uh, a, a deep study in the Book of Romans to I guess to to wreck me afresh of the overarching work of the gospel in that I am a sinner in desperate need of grace. And that only through the personal work of Jesus Christ that we can we can come to him, that we can be satisfied, right? And and there's a prayer that we use at our church that that really, really wrecked me. We call it the gospel prayer. And the first part of the gospel prayer is that God, there's nothing I can do to make you love me anymore. And there's nothing I can do to make you love me any less because of Christ. Mm-hmm. And like remembering that, you know, I had grown up not performance based stated so, if that makes sense. I mean, it, salvation was only through Christ alone and faith alone. There was no work that we could do. But once you got saved, it was all about you keeping in God's good favor is what it seemed like. Again, I don't think it was ever explicitly stated. And so I just, I'm a type A firstborn. And so people pleasing left and right. And so it was easy for me to be good mm-hmm. uh, to, to people. But my heart had and has so many dark areas that that Christ has to expose and clean afresh in my life and purge, if you will. That's been the wall. Having kids exasperates that and getting married also exasperates that. <laughs> Spoiler alert for anybody out there that doesn't have uh, kids or a wife yet. It's uh, spouse helps awaken you to really just the depths of your depravity. Mm-hmm. Almost every decision I make is self-focused. And so praise God, Christ is continually freeing me from that and mm-hmm. continuing to awaken me to new truths of his character and his goodness. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's kind of where we're at. So what age were you when you prayed? Took Jesus for salvation. 
couldn't tell you the exact age, six, okay. seven, eight, something okay. like that. I know I wasn't baptized until I was seven or eight, which is a fun thing for us as parents now. I don't know how kids actually get saved before they're 18. Our kids confess Christ constantly and, uh, and desire to know him, but we're having to look for those markers of, of what true repentance looks like and, a, and an actual understanding of sin and not wanting to hold our kids back. But understanding that, salvation, or that, excuse me, that baptism doesn't save us uh, mm-hmm. has been a, a big growth for me and my wife. And so we're holding our kids back from baptism right now and continuing to encourage and affirm the uh, the professions they're making and continuing to shove scripture into their hearts as much as possible. Uh, and, and we pray that God would awaken that in them and, uh, and call them into his kingdom and use them mightily. Amen. I've been blessed to see many uh, spiritual markers in your life as you've gotten involved in missions around the world and uh, missions through Global Hope India and not only going, but taking teams and influencing others to go let's dive into your experience Mm -hmm. in missions uh bring Mm -hmm. us up to speed been other places than just india where's god taking you for the great commission miscellaneous domestic trips all over the southeast mainly you know kentucky south virginia south but a good majority of those states on you know one week two week one month kind of situation and then uh, my first international trip was indonesia actually about eight years ago Mm -hmm. we thought i really felt like god was calling my wife and i to indonesia uh, to work full-time i'm an engineer and had several job offers Mm -hmm. in a closed country right a a country that's 99 percent muslim and is obstinate to christianity Mm -hmm. and they're inviting me in and willing to pay me double my salary so like Mm -hmm. it's it just seemed like a no-brainer. It really felt like God was calling us there. And so we went on a uh, what was a, a vision trip for us, but joining in with with some people going from our church, be able to serve with some local missionaries there. And that trip was awakening and very solidifying for my wife and I in understanding that Indonesia was not what God was calling us right then. Mm-hmm. But instead, he was calling us to a heart and a passion for mobilization uh, and seeing people engage with the church global uh, and the church universal and, and seeing that God is is the God of the nations and not just the God of the U.S. or of the South specifically. And so it was a very uh, eye opening trip and, and really sparked a fire in, in my heart and my wife's heart for mobilizing and equipping uh, the church there. Yeah, then we got partnered with, uh, well, we've known you for a while, but my wife decided she wanted to go on a medical trip with GHI, and that was probably eight years ago now as well. And and you took that conversation from me as that I was leading a trip. And so I found out <laughs> a few months later that I was I was leading a trip because uh, some of my friends had already signed up for a trip that I was leading. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. We, the way God does that. Oh, yeah. And uh, I mean, it was good. I mean, I didn't obviously didn't have a problem with it, but it was, uh, it was surprising that, you know, um, and to say the least, but yeah, we took off out of there and had a very eventful first trip to India, you know, got to experience the different methods of travel and got to experience uh, the people mm-hmm. uh, and the different church planners and went to several villages. And I took a team of engineers with me and teachers and nurses and, and just a, a very eclectic group. Mm-hmm. Um, and that trip really helped form and, and show me the uh, the value of a diverse group of people going to India, not necessarily on the same trip, but just period going because it is for everyone. They're seeing their hearts transformed and their eyes opened to the fact that the world is bigger than where they live, mm-hmm. that the people in India, in Asia need Jesus, just like we need Jesus, that they struggle with the same problems mm-hmm that we do with family dysfunction with poverty with fear about job loss with difficulty in relationships Mm -hmm. and that's what all the prayers were about right it isn't whatever we think they might be you know needing quote unquote sometimes we were praying for just a house to sleep in but I tell you, the, the vast majority of them were relational and were, were driven with the same issues that we struggle with here, the same stuff that we are crying out to God for, they're crying out to God for over there. And then seeing my, the people that we took over there with us in their, their eyes open, their hearts pricked for a people, be it in India or somewhere else, but, but being pricked and seeing how they fit into God's plan in these people's lives but also in the people's lives here in the States. So uh, I got to see so many people that we've taken over there, their, their prayers change, mm-hmm. right? They're, they're believing God for big things. They're expecting God to move mightily, not just because they uh, saw him move and transform people over there. I, on that first trip, I don't know that we saw more than one or two salvation. What we did see was people come alive here to catch on fire for God's mission 
in the church universal here mm-hmm. and understanding that they have a call and that their neighbors and that the, their co-workers and that people, that their dentists that they engage with need Jesus, just yes. like the people in India. Yes. And so the, the part that I loved about it, the thing that really set me off is seeing these people's hearts transformed, coming back to the States. Even if they don't go back overseas again, they're coming back transformed and ready to see God move. Mm-hmm. And they're expecting God to move. And they're believing God for big things. The Indian people, at least in the church that we, you know, that we were praying with, pray so much bolder than we do. You know, we asked God if it be his will. And they're, they were straight up telling God, like, I need this thing. They're crying out to him like a kid does, right? Mm-hmm. Like my kids do to me. It just it helped put a face to that. That first trip was really good. I've taken a few other trips since then to India and to uh, Colombia, South America. Visiting some missionary friends that we had there, and then he said influencing people to go or helping plan trips or whatever that looks like, and it's it's been good. But always with that same mission and mindset yeah. to see people's hearts and minds and lives transformed when they come back, which I really see is one of the major benefits that GHI brings to the table as well as the our church planners that we work with in India are indigenous, which is absolutely huge because it's not going to be Westerners that change India for right. the gospel. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. going to be the indigenous people that can identify with, that can work with, and can disciple and sharpen and deepen the gospel in these people's hearts uh, in India. I love every one of our church planners. They're all fantastic. They love God, and they want to see his name made known throughout all of India and the world. And then even how we've sent indigenous people on trips, right, with Justin and some of the other people. It's yeah. just amazing to see how the church here in the West can help influence and fund and equip church leaders to go out. Well, I've got... Lots of questions for you. Let's just go on a lighter note real quick. What's one of your funniest stories of your time in in India? India? Um, That's actually, that's a tough one. I mean, there's a bunch of absolutely random ones, but I'm I'm going to say one that probably segues into something else we're going to talk about. We were looking for a way to engage the community around one of our church planners. And you or somebody had the idea that we can just play volleyball outside. Let's just do it in the community too. The Mm -hmm. kids at the orphanage love playing it. So we decided let's play it too for the community. And I was taking a group of engineers and accountants and business people over that hear this rightly. We go outside, but it's on walks. We don't play sports professionally Mm -hmm. and uh, much less together. You know, we would play volleyball with the kids out front, but, but never uh, in a league or anything. And we set up a volleyball tournament. We, we show up and there had apparently been a lot of fanfare ahead of that time Mm -hmm. to tell the local community that a American volleyball team was coming to host a tournament. And so these Indians had been They've been practicing for weeks on their teams yeah. before we showed up. And all of us don't even live near each other. We were just showing up to you know, go to India together. And uh, we get there ready to play. And there are hundreds of people from the community there to watch us play. And we show up for this first game and they're introducing us. And we go to center court because you know, they want to highlight the team from America. They kept calling me the Josh Back team, uh, B-A-C-K, <laughs> which because there's a little bit of a translation issue, I reckon. And. So we're all laughing about that. And then we played that first game, rally scoring, mind you. So that mm-hmm. means you score no matter what. And we lost 21 to two. The only reason we scored two points was because they missed serves that they served out back trying to really smoke us. And then they walked up to us and told us what an embarrassment we were to America uh, <laughs> yes. as, as America's team. Yes. And we, we could not get enough of that. So I, I may seem like a demoralizing story, but it's one that I have a fond memory of, but just being not at all what we expected and then getting just demolished on the field. <laughs> yeah. Share with us, how, how was that impactful for the gospel, if at all? Oh, man, I'll tell you what, it was, it may be the most effective thing we've ever done in taking a short-term trip over there and at least influencing the other teams because we had hundreds of people, like I said, watching us play. And that came out of the woodwork to, to come and watch us in the local community. And the whole time that we're playing, you know, this is a, it's a, it wasn't a round robin tournament, a single elimination tournament, so we're out immediately. Mm-hmm. But there's still five or six other teams that we're going to play. So we were watching games. And the whole time, the, the church planners are the ones hosting this event. They're proclaiming the gospel over the intercom, kind of in between the breaks, like, oh, Team A scored. And. By the way, Jesus is the only way that you can come to to heaven to know God forever, eternal life is necessary. Like just constantly sharing the gospel mm-hmm. and inviting everyone there to an awards ceremony that night mm-hmm. hosted at the church. Mm-hmm. We weren't expecting much. This is at two o'clock in the afternoon. The awards ceremony wasn't until after supper at, say, six or seven. But that evening at, at six or seven o'clock, there are hundreds of people in the church mm-hmm. 
for this quote unquote award ceremony. And the way the award ceremony worked is for the first, I don't know, hour, the local pastor shared his testimony, which is one of uh, one from Hinduism into, into faith in Christ mm-hmm. and a clear gospel presentation. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I shared the gospel very clearly. And then my wife shared her testimony with the gospel very clearly. And then another team member shared his go- or his testimony with the gospel very clearly. And so they're getting the gospel just poured over them and, and, and a clear call and a beg to know Jesus. Yeah. And then the pastor got up again and said, hey, maybe these guys weren't clear enough. You need <laughs> Jesus desperately. And the whole time, yeah, these guys are just waiting on trophies. And this mm-hmm. is hundreds of people sitting in this church. Mm-hmm. And in the back, the associate pastors and the workers are weeping and praying over these people and mm-hmm. hugging me and saying, Josh, you don't understand. We've been praying for these people to come to church and they never come. But they came for this yeah. and we just beat them over the head with the gospel. And so I don't I don't know you know, how many salvations came out of that. I don't know was that church blew up because of that mm-hmm. or anything at all. But what I'm confident of is that these people wouldn't have darkened the doors of this church mm-hmm. and heard the gospel on a normal week, but instead hundreds of them flocked there to play volleyball with a bunch of people that don't play volleyball. And they heard the gospel over and over. So it was, it was a shot in the arm to our local church planners and giving them exposure they wouldn't have had. Yeah, and so, so that I was there. Made, I was there. Yeah, and I remember yeah. uh, just sitting and observing from the front and I could see people's faces, faces the yeah. entire meeting. And yeah. no one had locked the doors. They could mm-hmm. have at any moment gotten up and mm-hmm. left and went mm-hmm. home if they mm-hmm. really felt offended, if they really felt pressured or anything, but they didn't. And the, yeah. the, with the look on their face, especially as the teaching happened and as the testimonies were going on, was intrigued. They, they really were genuinely intrigued. The Spirit of God was moving. And what had happened was in the afternoon, they had royally beat the American team, but what they oh, so saw, bad. what they saw not only was a defeat, but they saw the humility of friendship and, mm-hmm. and love that that represented. And, mm-hmm. and so they really, at that moment, cared about what the Americans had to say and even the local pastor had to say. Mm-hmm. And God, mm-hmm. I mean, you're right. We don't necessarily know the prayers of salvation and what, what happened in heaven that night, but we know that God was moving. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And. You know, that trip or that that event precipitated the idea to take other trips, but with this main focus in mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because so often, you know, I grew up thinking that short-term trips were really about us, again, Westerners, going to places that don't have the gospel and pouring that over people and really hitting them hard with street evangelism and and sharing the gospel with them and expecting a a call to salvation, which is good and right and expected on trips. Yeah. Right. I mean, we've had the opportunity to do that on multiple trips Mm -hmm. that leaves without a local connection or connection to a local church or at least a church planner there for discipleship that leaves discipleship as something wanting and honestly difficult. And so you see a lot of fruit in the, in the rocky soil, if you will, that springs up maybe, and Mm -hmm. then disappears. Mm -hmm. And, Instead, seeing a, a much better impact, if you will, in going and equipping mm-hmm. our local church planners and going and availing them to opportunities and exposure they would not normally have, like this volleyball trip. You had Andrew Jarman on a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. and I'm sure he talked about it, but their trip, you know, with, with Peyton and Brittany Spivey as well, like being able to go and play volleyball on a circuit, basically, in yeah. three or four villages around. I mean, honestly, they're, they're playing volleyball for Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. And having these word ceremonies and sharing the gospel with people is just such a, an easy way mm-hmm. to draw people in, much like the medical clinics that GHI puts on, right? We're not really providing, quote unquote, high-end medical care, right? We're handing out multivitamins and Tylenol mm-hmm. and blood pressures and things, but we're giving people what they desperately need, which is exposure to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And we're praying over them and we're expecting big things. And I mean, those, those are some of the best things I think GHI does mm-hmm. and does a good job of working with our local church planners all. And I, I've loved it every time. And you're right. Andrew's trip really springboard out of this volleyball tournament, one volleyball tournament mm-hmm. in Arissa. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. it was multiplied out. Let's go back and just dive in. You're an engineer and you're talking Mm -hmm. about engineers and accountants and nurses and teachers. What could God possibly do through an engineer on a mission trip? Mm. And what's your passion behind? Because you said it earlier, missions is for all people. There's not a career on the planet that is exempt from the call to go. What have you seen God do there? 
Well, I don't know if you know it, but most engineers are nerds. Mm. That's a technical term, but um, mm-hmm. traditionally, you know, there's a stereotype that goes behind that. Most uh, most engineers don't want to engage with people or only want to do things that they're comfortable with and really have things set up well for them. That first trip was probably about half to three quarters engineers and then the other half nurses. And then I had some other just teachers and mm-hmm. hotel employees and random things as well. But uh, it was it was presented as an engineering trip. And for a bunch of planners, our trip got changed the week before we left. Mm-hmm. So everything we've been planning for and drawn up and prepared for to be a blessing as quote unquote engineers to these these church planners just got wrecked the week before we left. And so we were we were stressing pretty hard at the airport, even trying to figure out what on earth we were even going to do while in country to use and leverage the engineering talents that we had for the kingdom of God. And, and don't get me wrong, we did over that trip. God provided many ways that we were able to, to do that sporadically through some site planning or some production planning or even drawing up some quick and cheap to assemble uh, church shelters mm-hmm. uh, using using local materials. And we said so we provided some sketches and drawings around that. We've taken some other trips that we helped with overarching site planning and whatnot. And I used to really believe that taking people on trips that allowed them to use their skill sets and passions for their jobs was the main, a big, a big thing to do for short term. And I do still believe that, but I would never want someone to say no to an opportunity to go overseas because they're not sure how their job might fit in. Right. A lot of times we can easily see how teachers fit in, right? Like, Oh, help teach our kids English. And that's great except you're only going to maybe be in this country for eight days. Mm -hmm. And there's only so much English you can teach in eight days. There's only so much, uh, so many things that you can teach the kids or the different people that you may be engaging with. And those are needed, but I don't want people to think that's the only value they bring. One of the girls that went on our first trip, I believe manages an apartment complex. And even I remember in her testimony after the trip, she said, apparently this trip was for engineers and I had no idea. I signed up for something that I didn't, I didn't pay attention to. But it turns out God had me here anyway. Mm -hmm. And to see how God used her on that trip as an encourager, as uh, as as a as a a catalyst for the local church planner's wife and some of the other ladies that were there, and being able to push them into uh, opportunities and relationships for engaging with the people in India was just night and day. But what I'll say is even maybe most importantly, though, this girl came back to the States with a greater vision and understanding of who God is and what his desire is when he says, all nations will bow down before me and worship me and glory to the lamb that was slain. She understood that more deeply now and that call that now as the residents come into her apartment complex, she's able to to see them as a person and care for them better. Mm -hmm. She's able to love them well and to look for needs and opportunities to pray for people. She's able to pray more boldly and speak more boldly when she talks about it. She also came back with a ready-to-go testimony yes. because that, that she doesn't have to find a way to shoehorn into a conversation. She literally, people can say, hey, what did you do last week? Oh, I was in India. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, what? You were, you were where? Yeah. India, the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I came back from there. Mm-hmm. What were you doing there, right? Yes. And it just immediately allows you to start sharing the gospel with someone. You don't have to tell them all about driving on the wrong side of the road or swerving all around through crazy traffic or whatever that looks like. You don't have to worry about that stuff. God is immediately opening up doors for the people that she engages with day in and day out and does have an opportunity to disciple here. Just because she went, she's got a conversation started. And now that her heart is on fire for seeing these people come to know Jesus, uh, she's, able to, she's able to be a powerful force mm-hmm. for the gospel of Jesus here in the state, all because she signed up for an accidental trip that she read wrong about. So that's why I say that the trips are for everyone. Mm-hmm. The going is for everyone. And God used her over there mm-hmm. on the trip. I mean, she was a massive blessing, but I'd say her impact stateside has been tenfold what it even could have been there. I like your balance between skills and opportunity. And I've been with you on several of, of the trips over to India. And I've heard you say this more than once. It's really not about the program. It's gospel first. And now imagine yourself on the forward mission field. You and your team are on the bus going to today's programs. After singing a few songs, Pastor Kevin stands to deliver a devotion. Come on.
on now. I'm ready. Okay, everyone, gather around. I have an exciting word That's to right. share with you before we go out into today's program. Today's word is worship. Everyone say worship. One, two, three, worship. I want you to really think of that word as we go out. You can easily think that we're going out to serve. We're going to be doing today's program. We're going to be praying. We're going to be distributing. We're going to be playing. I want you to hear the word worship. This is an act of worship. You did not leave worship on Sunday when we left the chapel. This is a continuation of worship. I want you to hear this passage in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. I want you to understand that Jesus coming to earth, 100% God, 100% man, was an act of worship. It was obedience to the Father. The Son was obeying the Father. He was worshiping. But I want you to even hear the context here. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. I don't know if you have noticed But the cross is shameful. It is ugly. We're talking about our Savior that was beat beyond recognition. His blood poured out on the cross for you and I. And it is in that moment that he finds joy. That is an expression of worship. We have every opportunity to complain, every opportunity to be bitter, Every opportunity to get angry about having to do this service to the Lord. But Jesus found joy even in going to the cross. Why? How? How is that even possible? Jesus knows how this story ends. And so do you. You know how this story ends. You know that we will be spending eternal life in him eternal life in heaven with him. It says, now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. You're going to be worshiping before almighty God for all eternity, praising Jesus for all eternity. And this is an opportunity today to go out in the service and allow that worship to take from heaven up to the earth, to transfer from heaven to the earth. Don't wait until you get to heaven to start worshiping 24-7, 365. You can worship now. If Jesus, the one that we are following, can go to an ugly, shameful cross and find a place of worship even in the cross, surely you and I can find a place of worship in today's program, when you are playing, when you are praying, when you are serving, when you are distributing, do it unto the Lord. Let it be an act of worship. I want you to be singing throughout the day. I want you to be memorizing scripture. I want you to be praying. I want you to think of being in the house of God as you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to be in a place of worship today. Today's program is a call to worship. Are you ready? Let's go. One, two, three. Global Hope India empowers the church in India through multiple channels. One of the most influential methods has proven to be sending individuals on short-term trips to India. During your 10 days in India, you will make a difference, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and see the lives of Indian internationals transformed by the gospel. We have opportunities in children's ministry, women's ministry, job training, medical missions, and more. Experience a life-changing adventure. If you're looking to make an impact, India is the place, 
and GHI is the opportunity. See our trips at globalhopeindia.org forward slash go. We want to give some local love to the professionals at Big Jerry's Fencing based in Apex, North Carolina. They are your local fence company specializing in residential fences, commercial fences, custom wood, aluminum, chain link, and vinyl. Big Jerry's Fencing offers all types of fence installations to residential and commercial builders. Everyone knows that today for a company to have five stars on Google means a lot. Big Jerry's Fencing has a five-star review. We recognize Jerry Davis's witness for Christ and their incredible generosity for expanding heaven. Check out their website at bigjerrysfencing.com. What is it that you really see as the primary point of missions? Ooh, of missions in general or just short-term missions? Uh, short, short-term. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The first thing I'm going to tell them is to go. Mm-hmm. For anybody that's listening to me now, go. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter where you go. As long as you go and you go with an organization or a group or a church or a a church planner that is seeking to make Christ known everywhere, Mm -hmm. not just in the particular country they're in, but in the way they're equipping and challenging and transforming you. Yeah. Um, Honestly, I see more work. And this is out of hundreds of people now that we've influenced or talked with or dealt with. I see more work in the hearts of the people that go than I do on the ground of people they engaged with. And, and, and this is why I'm partnered with GHI. This is why we promote this is because GHI does such a good job of, of setting up the trip to remove a lot of the roadblocks and obstacles that may keep, that may, that may prevent the Holy Spirit from working in your heart the same way when you go. Yeah. You don't have to worry about how you're going to get there or, you know, what happens if our flight gets canceled or anything else. They take care of all that. But then, they also engage with a good church planner, like an indigenous church planner that is seeking to make Christ known in India, but also wants to genuinely engage with you and see your heart transformed, either for the people of India, but at a minimum after God. And so I can trust and believe that everybody that we send to India with GHI is going to go and experience a similar type of thing where it, it provides ample opportunity for them to get wrecked over the fact that God is bigger than their bubble they live in Mm -hmm. and that God wants them to be a part of something bigger than the four people they know. And that God wants to change and transform them to make them more like Jesus. He wants to conform them to the image of his son and he wants to to draw them into deeper relationship with him. So you want to experience God. You want to see and know and understand more of who God is. That's growing deeper in the gospel. And you're going to get that when you go. Mm-hmm. on these trips and and engage with local church planners and when you see their passion for people mm-hmm. and then bring that passion back here to the states or wherever you're from mm-hmm. you bring that back to your hometown and take more people with you so the first and foremost is go just go and but go obviously go with someone good go with someone that that is, is looking after um, is, is running after christ yeah don't go just to go yeah, don't yeah, don't 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 go on a missioncation, right? We're often doing the mission vacations where right. really we're just going to shop and enjoy mm-hmm. uh, uh whatever you know this cultural experience is and try some new foods. It's you know, we want to go to see Christ made known mm-hmm. in India, in Asia, in South America, and in the US. And spoiler alert, you're only gonna be there eight to ten days. You're gonna be in the States for years if the Lord wills. Mm-hmm. So pour into where you are and awaken that passion in you and yes. take somebody with you yeah. take somebody with you. oh man I, I can talk about this all day I know you, can. I know you, can. <laughs> you can write it. so uh, obviously this podcast champions that very reality that god uses missions to change our lives we do go hoping and praying that god somehow in spite of us will work and that it will be a blessing to the church there and that we will mm-hmm. be able to empower them we quickly get there, get in over our heads and realize, you mean God brought me here just to change me, to begin working in my life? So twofold question, what do you look back and see, how has God used missions to change your life? In, in giving me a sense of purpose is, is too strong a phrase, but I'm going to say purpose in my understanding of how I fit into the body of Christ at my local church and in the people that I, I see week in and week out. He clarified a call to mobilization and influencing uh, for me and my wife 
uh, which is which is why we push so many people in the way that we do and the way that we engage with them. We look for opportunities. We look for ways that they can engage the kingdom of God, be that be that internationally or be that uh, in, in their local church. We have a desire and a passion for that because of because of our short term trips. You've mentioned it a couple of times, but I'd love for you just to give us two or three first names and some examples of how you've witnessed firsthand God use missions to change other people's lives because you mm. brought that up a couple of times. So give us some examples. I know you got hundreds, but just two or three. Yeah, um, man, to, one. To one. I'm gonna help you. With, I'm gonna help you with one. James, mm-hmm. tell yeah. me. About, tell us about James. Yeah. So uh, James is a guy that wasn't sure about why he should go on a trip ever. You know, as a as a guy that only got two weeks a year vacation, why does he need to burn a week or a week and a half overseas uh, going to a place he doesn't like the food or the people? Through creative arm twisting and influencing, uh, we got him to go. And I think it was maybe day three. It could have been day four. I'm not sure. James got awakened to the goodness of Christ mm-hmm. in the world and, and God's heart and passion and desire for people. And I, I had him pray over a particular orphanage that we were at. And his heart had been so broken over them that this man that barely had ever prayed before with us started praying and believing God for for big and great things over these kids. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I don't mean like, oh, a home for every one of them or anything like that. I'm talking about uh, unity across classes and seeing the caste system still at work and seeing the fact that they needed Jesus to, to awaken them afresh to the unity that we have as, as people made in the image of God and needing and desiring that we are all shut up under sin and needing Christ to set us free from that. Like praying those bold things over these kids. Yeah. And so through tears, this man is doing this and expecting God to move mightily. Mm-hmm. And then he comes back to your stateside and his prayer life is forever different. The way that he prays for people, the the fact that he is calling me out to pray differently mm-hmm. and, and saying, no, Josh, like we got to pray about this thing now mm-hmm. and expecting God to move. And, and just seeing that change in his life was, was absolutely massive. I remember one of your teammates came back and his primary testimony is I'm now praying with my wife. Was that James yeah. or was that someone else? Oh man, I don't know. I, I, maybe, I hear that one all the maybe, time. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, I've taken a bunch of spouses. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say I've taken a bunch of spouses, and every time that's what they come back with mm-hmm. is realizing I lead my family as the husband after God, and what that looks like is taking the initiative, and then just seeing that it's seeing the importance of God, right? Like Colossians one tells us that Christ reigns supreme; that He is over all and in all; that He is. He is the whole point of everything mm-hmm. and the, the unifying aspect of all of humanity besides our, us all being shut up under sin is that everything is for Christ's glory. And so understanding that it is his job as a husband is to draw people in that direction and to draw his wife in that direction, mm-hmm. even if she doesn't really want to, or even if he's not quote unquote, very good at it, just reading scripture together and holding up the goodness of Christ to his wife as humbly as he can. Uh, has been has been some major changes we've seen. Well, I have another story, and maybe you have one more, but our time's about to run out. I'd love for sure. you just to share uh, the connection that God made, even with a vendor in the USA, and the impact yeah. that they've now had over in India through clean water projects, and the hope that they're maybe even going to get to visit soon. Yeah, um, how did that happen? Well, one of our uh, one of our vendors, another guy on the board named Stephen. He and I have worked together for a long time, and this vendor is a is a professing Christian. We talk about our faith left and right, and kind of challenge one another every time we see each other to get together for lunch. And one day we were just talking, and this vendor said, "Hey, you know, we hear you go on these trips. Part of our company's desire." is to give back some of our profits each year Mm -hmm. to charities. He goes, but people have to submit these charities. And so I, on a whim, submitted GHI, and specifically me and Stephen's trip, which they, of course, were obliged to give to, which we were very thankful for. And so they enabled us to go, and then they wanted to hear about our trip. And as we talk more about it, this is a company that does, that sells pumps and water treatment systems and chemical supply systems. And it just seemed to fit well within the company's mantra of giving back. And the fact that the owners were Christian fit well too. So we helped get you guys in the door uh, just to give a presentation to the, to what I thought was just going to be the leadership. But from what I understand it, you got to present to the whole company yeah. uh, that was there. And, and then through that, the company got to see that, hey, this is just an easy group for us to partner with. And I have to worry about constant submissions to our charity request form. 
but instead something that fits with what we're doing with clean water projects. You know, that's something that, that GHI does a lot with, with our church planners. And they were able to immediately sponsor one of the divi units, yeah. uh, which enables our church planners to respond very quickly in times of crisis, mm-hmm. flooding, um, uh, hurricanes, et cetera. Um, and being able to come in very quickly and provide clean water out of a dirty water source. Yeah. And so people just come in to get that need met of clean water, but being able to have that met by a local church planner that loves them and cares for them gives that local church planner an avenue for the gospel share. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and real engagement because it's a tangible hands into Jesus, right? So it's, it's never just here's a cup of clean water. It's here's a cup of clean water and also who you use Jesus. And so you're meeting with the spiritual and physical need. And all of that's because this company was being faithful to what God has given them in pouring back into the world. Very cool. I'm so grateful for the way that God connects the dots like that just continuously exposes because what that represents is that Josh went and God gave him passion to see the gospel advanced in India. And then just through a casual conversation, uh, there was money given, funding provided that didn't come out of Josh's back pocket and Mm -hmm. all Josh had to do basically to join God in that work was just give a testimony. And, Mm -hmm. but that's the ripple effect. I look at what God's done in the 20 years now that I've been involved and it's way beyond anything I could have ever dreamed of that would come out of my own wallet. But Mm -hmm. it's the influence of, of those people that have come back and poured generosity out. And probably, I don't know that global hope India has ever, Uh, done the analytics on this, but the vast majority of the funds are probably outside of the thousand that we have taken. My point is it's not necessarily the the largest generosity is not necessarily within the thousand that have gone, but it's been a result of the thousand Mm -hmm. that that have gone. Uh, That's right. Josh, you have any other questions? I mean, any other stories for us before we say goodbye? I mean, again, we could go on all day, but people aren't listening to a podcast for that. Yeah. Um, I would just, I would leave you one final word of go mm-hmm. like sign up and go if ghi is a great place to go but even if it isn't ghi go somewhere with a good organization right. that's engaging well for the kingdom of god and I, you're gonna see your heart and life change i promise so josh i'd love for you just to close out the episode with prayer you mentioned the word sure. purpose in your own life pray however the spirit leads but just think about that word purpose as we pray father god we thank you that we can come to you and expect big things from you that we can expect that you love us because we know that you love us because you sent your son to die for us, to rescue us from damnation and darkness and, and brought us into and transferred us into the kingdom of your beloved son, into the kingdom of life. God, that we have a hope eternal set on high because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I pray that truth over all those that are listening, God, and expect for you to, to move in us because you love us, because you want to make us more like Christ, because you want to uh, continue to conform us to the image of your son. God, I pray that you would give each of us a, a specific purpose and understanding and how we fit into your kingdom, that we would not walk uh, idly by or we would just pass through this life uh, very slowly, Lord, but instead we would run after you with great intentionality yes. and understanding that you have put a clear call and a will into our lives about how we fit into what you desire. And that's for all men to be saved. Mm-hmm. And that salvation comes from you, but you are using men to, to spread that word and to, to make your name known in the world. And so we pray that you would help us to do that, that you would help us to see how we fit into that, Lord, as, as senders, as mobilizers, as goers, and as missionaries, God, to understand that we are on mission for life everywhere, every day, no matter where we are. So God, give us courage and give us boldness and give us wisdom in how to run into this world, proclaiming the great name of Jesus. God, that it be for your glory that we live and breathe and die. You are awesome and magnificent, and we declare glory to the Lamb that was slain. Hallelujah. And come soon, Lord Jesus. His name, amen. Amen. Josh, thank you so much. Of course, man. Can't wait to interview Katie soon. Uh, But God bless you. I pray that you and your family stay healthy and safe and impactful. Yeah, God bless you. you. Thank you, buddy. We're giving away a Starbucks gift card this month to one of our amazing listeners. Go to globalhopeindia.org slash missions and fill out the quick free Starbucks form. We will randomly select a lucky listener, so enter now for your chance to win. This episode is complete, so head over to globalhopeindia.org for show notes, resources, and opportunities to go to India through GHI. 
Continue to be radically transformed by God as you live out the Great Commission. And we'll see you again next week here at Missions Change My Life.